Last episode, we talked about different number sets. Naturals, which are the whole counting numbers. Integers, which are both positive and negative whole numbers, with zero. Fractions, which are ratios of integers. Algebraic numbers, which are numbers built from any combination of integers and operations. And transcendentals, which is basically everything else, like pi. But as we saw last time, a big problem snuck in right under our noses. The issue stems from one particular combination of integer with an operation that originates in the set of algebraic numbers. The number is negative 1, and the operation is square rooting. To see the issue with this particular combo, we're going to have to dig into square roots and squaring. What is the square of some given number? The answer, whatever you get when you multiply the number by itself. So 3 squared gives you 9. Square roots are the opposite. What is the square root of a number? The answer, whatever multiplied by itself gives you the number you started with. For example, what is the square root of 4? That is, what times itself gives you 4? The answer is 2, because 2 times 2 is 4. The other answer is negative 2, but for right now, I want to focus on the principal or positive square root. Not every integer has a square root that's also a nice, neat integer. If you look at the square root of 2, it's the decimal from last episode. But if you multiply this long decimal by itself, however hard that may be for a person to actually do, you really do get 2. Pretty cool. So why is there a problem with the square root of negative 1? Well, let's ask the question like we just did. What times itself gives you negative 1? The problem is that there is not an answer to this question. It's not that it's just some decimal we can't write down in its entirety. Nothing multiplied by itself gives you negative 1. Let's see why. We can tackle this in two parts, the number and the sign. The number is easy. 1 times itself gives you 1, so we got that done. The problem is with the sign. Obviously, we can't multiply a positive number by itself and wind up with a negative, so positive 1 doesn't work. But then again, when you multiply a negative number by itself, which would be two negatives multiplied together, you get a positive number, so negative 1 doesn't work either. And those really are your only two options. Any candidate will have to be either positive or negative, and we've just ruled out both options. So what now? Well, it looks like we have two basic approaches to handle this. One, the simplest, is that we can say that rooting negatives is just banned, much like we say that division by zero is banned. This is what happened historically. Any number that involved the square roots of all negatives, indeed any even roots of a negative, they were cast out, and what remained were called the real numbers. As it turns out, there is a better way, which brings me to the creator's approach. We invent a new type of number that accounts for the problem. Let's take the root of negative 1 and give it a name i for imaginary, so-called to contrast it with the reals. This is super useful, because it gives us a way to reduce an infinite number of problems down to just a single problem, really just a single number. For example, all of these numbers can be rewritten to be nearly identical, but with an i instead of a negative under the square root. Notice what just happened. Every other part of that number is a real number, meaning we've basically got the imaginary part, the part that gives us trouble, isolated. Now all we need to do is to figure out how all of the rules work for i, and we solve all of our problems. In the past, a lot of work was done to figure out if maths that included i still made sense. Spoiler alert, it does. We'll see i show up again in the future, where we'll learn all of those rules. For right now, though, I want to focus on the sets that we just made. The set of reals we will define informally, every decimal you could ever build. This can come from integers or rationals, which give nice, easy-to-understand decimals, or like the algebraic set, potentially combining infinite numbers of integers and operations, but without any imaginary numbers allowed in. By contrast, here are the purely imaginary numbers. They look like this, where b can be any real number. These two things multiplied together create an imaginary number. One easy way to look at it is that the imaginary numbers include every real number, multiple of i in this set. But what would happen if we put them together, real and imaginary? Would that be complex? Why, yes, it would. In fact, that's what we call them, the complex numbers. You literally just combine, with addition or subtraction, all of the reals to all of the imaginary numbers. And there you have it. We have invented a new type of number and the set it lives in. As I mentioned earlier, numbers are ideas, even simple numbers like 7. The payoff of this perspective is this. 
when we come across problems, we can invent new ideas, new numbers, and try to explore the rules surrounding them to get things done. In this case, it was the imaginary number i, though that is by no means the only kind of thing you can create. Vectors, matrices, polynomials, even hypercomplex numbers called quaternions. These all help us solve certain problems. Quaternions, for example, help computers rotate things in 3D, among other things. This brings up a few very important questions. When can we invent a new number, and when should we? To answer the first question, there are some rules we need to follow. The system that includes our new thing needs to be free of contradictions. That is, we can't have statements like 1 equals 2, or some statements that are both true and false at the same time. But what about the second question? When should we invent new numbers? Or for that matter, new sets, or new operations, new mathematics? Let me paint you a picture. Some mathematician has some great idea, spends a few years developing it, and develops some answers to some really hard but abstract questions. Elsewhere, some scientist, we'll say physicist for the sake of argument, is trying to understand some system they're working on but don't have adequate maths to do so, and so they go rummaging around in the world of math to try to find some solution to their problem. The stuff that the mathematician made turns out to be just right for what the physicist needs, and then boom, application. You can probably already see the problems here. Why doesn't the physicist just develop the math they need when they need it? How does the mathematician ever know the stuff they're researching and creating will ever be picked up by a scientist? Isn't there a more efficient process to plug in the work of the mathematician to the work of the scientist? These are all really just questions about how to streamline and optimize the research process, pushing forward the frontier of human understanding, and like most human endeavors, it's an organic one. There are no simple answers. Streamlining and optimization are worthwhile problems to try and tackle, but they are very rarely straightforward. Ultimately, the should question gets answered by you, the mathematician. For that reason, I say, if it works and you can create it and you find joy in it, do so. There are many other situations that I shows up in mathematics, in electronics, in circuits, quantum physics, and other technical fields, and in each one of them, we wouldn't have been able to make progress without an understanding of this crazy number, this wild idea. Today, we learned about three new sets. The real numbers, every possible decimal, the imaginary numbers, every possible decimal times i, and the complex numbers, which is just a combination of all the elements from the previous two sets. Thanks to Aragami for hosting this episode of the Taylor series, and congratulations to you on successfully completing your next term in your own Taylor expansion. I'm Derek Taylor, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.